or Learn at Home is our virtual programming that we've been able to provide since lockdown started. And this is our fourth month, I believe, of providing um, virtual you know, programs for you guys. And we're really excited. Um, do you mind going to the next slide, Maria? We're really excited to you know, bring you different topics every single week. This week, we're focusing on waste and specifically waste in the fashion industry. So we want to thank all our sponsors and donors, specifically the John Senator Fund, Legacy Fund, who allows us to do this work, as well as um, Subaru Sherman Oaks. And we're just really excited to be hosting this live lesson today. And if you follow our social media, you'll see that we, we've been posting um, fun videos on how to do DIY um, clothes repurposing, as well as other educational um, posts and videos. And every week the topic is different. So next week we have, um, well, next week we have a break, but the week after that uh, we have native plant maintenance. And then we have other topics that relate to water. We have topics that relate to um, climate change and urban heat. And these are all issues that are really relevant to Los Angeles. And we always have a action-based solution perspective because we, we not only want to educate um, our followers and supporters, but we also want to provide um, ways for our volunteers and followers to take action in their everyday lives. So today is no different. We're gonna be focusing on waste in the fashion industry and I'm really excited to introduce our presenter, Maria Adame, who is a youth leadership coordinator. I'm actually also a youth leadership coordinator. We're both from the education department and our job is to engage youth. And so this is a topic that Maria is extremely passionate about and I'll just pass it on to her to let herself, uh, to let her introduce herself. Thank you, Emmy. Thanks for uh, helping me out with uh, moderation for the day. Uh, as Emmy mentioned, my name is Maria Adame. Uh, I'm a youth leadership coordinator here at Tree People. And what we do is we give presentations much like this one to students in grades six through 12 um, that focus on waste and water issues being faced by LA County. And so um, our job is essentially to help give students the, le the leadership skills that they need to take service learning projects into their own hands and carry them out. And um, for me, my passion for fashion, I guess, um, was born from my grandma. My grandma used to make dresses and she was into embroidering and painting flowers on fabrics. And I just kind of grew up with her seeing her do that. And it made me fall in love with that. But I didn't really think that I was going to pursue anything related to that when I was younger. Um, but I was given, given the opportunity to take a couple of textile and um, craftsmanship classes in uh my college days. So I did take those and I fell in love with it. And why not tie both of my passions together? Uh, I was already working at Tree People doing environmental work and I thought, well, this makes sense. Environmental uh, issues are tied to fashion, right? With fashion and sustainability. So that's what we're going to be talking today. I do want to emphasize that um, all of the information that I'll be sharing with you today is coming from what I learned in school. I am not a professional. So this is gonna be a sort of 101 class on sustainability and fashion. By the way, Maria, I don't know if you know this, but I committed to not buying any new clothes since I think a little over a year ago. So I've been only shopping at thrift stores um, because I learned about all these environmental impact, but I don't know much about the textile and the actual materials. So I'm really excited to learn today. Of course, I hope I can bring at least one new uh, idea or fact to you all. So uh, moving forward, let's talk about traditional fashion versus fast fashion. So in traditional fashion, garments are typically handmade. And what that means is that large amounts of work and detail are put into the garments. And that not only increases the price point of these, but also their longevity, right? If a garment is really well made, what that's going to do is it's going to make it last longer in our closets. Another thing we have to keep in mind with traditional fashion is that the long turnaround rate and slow production process keep designs from being released uh, 
keep designs from being released more than two or three times a year. And that's why we have seasons, right? With tradi traditional fashion, the two seasons we typically see are spring, summer, and fall and winter. Sometimes uh, we have a resort collection, but that's not very typical. With fast fashion, the, I guess, the all of the things that we used with traditional fashion have gotten flipped. New styles are no longer brought to the market on a seasonal basis. Instead, they appear in stores multiple times a week. And with a constant inflow of new designs, consumers no longer feel satisfied with their clothing, right? This causes an increase in purchase of new clothing and disposal of old clothing at an ever increasing rate. This demand has forced retailers to lower the cost of pro to produce garments, and that lowers the quality of the items being produced. In order to do that, lower wages have to be implemented, and um, for employees who are working on the creation of fabrics to the manufacturing of the items themselves. More than 60% of the world's garments are manufactured in um, de developing countries. So what that means is we are essentially mistreating people in developing countries so that we can look really good, right? And we don't wanna do that. And when people think about sustainability, what comes to mind initially is the environmental impacts, but it goes so much further than that, right? At Tree People, it says it in our name, we're Tree People. Part of environmentalism is the people part. And we have to take that into consideration where fast fashion is concerned as well. Here I have a production schedule that kind of shows how slow fashion and traditional fashion fall against fast fashion. Slow fashion is a little different than traditional fashion. It's not, you know, runway, couture, or whatever you may. Uh, slow fashion is more similar to fast fashion in that it's kind of more, you know, underground brands that are not, are not necessarily putting on fashion shows uh, every, you know, twice a year, but they're conscious of this waste issue and try to produce designs only twice a year. So that decreases the amount of shopping that we consumers do. With fast fashion, as we can see here, we have 50 plus cycles. I always forget this, but there's actually 52 weeks in the year. So that means that roughly every week we are putting out new designs on the racks for people to purchase. And as I mentioned, what that's going to do is that's gonna make us feel more inclined to go shopping for whatever is gonna make us fit in or look cooler, whatever the new in thing is. And then there's also ultra fast fashion, which is less common, but still an issue with brands like Forever 21 who actually end up releasing new designs up to three times a week. So, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of garments that have to be produced, a lot of designs that have to be made, and a lot of consuming as well. And that coupled with our linear economy is actually uh, part of the reason we have such a big waste issue. A linear economy means that our products go from being natural resources that we have to grow, harvest, um, extract, right? And then these natural resources move on to production where they're turned into the products that we're going to buy. And then consumption, where we the consumers take those uh, items and use them for ourselves. And last but not least, when we think we're all done with those, we throw them away and that creates waste. So let's look at some facts about uh, waste in the fashion industry. Prior to World War I, used clothing was repaired, handed down, and repurposed. That's not really the case today. Today, the U.S. generates 25 billion pounds of post-consumer textile waste per year. And these post-consumer textiles include clothing, footwear, linens, towels, among other fabrics. Sorry, there was some background noise, so I thought I'd let it go. <laughs> but, uh, that makes for 82 pounds of clothing waste per person per year. That is almost a whole human, right? And of those 82 pounds, 70 pounds of that end up in the landfill, meaning that on average, each American donates 12 pounds of textiles annually. Of those 12 pounds, zero to 20% are sold in thrift stores, 45 become secondhand clothing sold in foreign markets, 30% are used to make wiping rags, 
20% are shredded for insulation, carpet padding, and the automotive industry. And 5% are unfit for reuse and are sent to the landfill. So we're factoring of those 82 pounds, 12 are being donated. But of those 12 pounds, five are still being sent to the landfill. So essentially, most of what we're throwing out is ending in the landfill. But we have to really think about that because we can't just think about the amount of stuff that we're sending to the landfill. We also have to consider the material of what we're sending to the landfill, right? It's not just about quantity of our waste. It's about the quality of our waste. So that's what we're going to get into. But before I cover that in depth, I wanted to ask you, Emmy, if uh, you noticed any questions coming in from me or anything like that that you'd want me to address? Great point. Um, I just uh, said it to everybody in the chat that if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll answer them uh, during the Q&A session. So feel free to ask, ask any questions in the chat. Well, if we don't have any uh, questions currently in, then I will continue to move forward. But please, like Emmy said, feel free to ask. Now we're going to talk about fibers. Cotton was used in ancient China, Egypt, India, Mexico, and Peru. Eli Whitney sawtoothed cotton gin streamlined the way cotton was produced, and by 1859, U.S. production was at 4.5 million bales of cotton, two-thirds of the world's production total. Cotton was the leading fiber that was used up until we discovered synthetic fibers. And I'm going to get into that. But before I do, I want to show you all a graph that shows us what the um, fiber production is currently, right? So 28% is cotton, less than 1% one, uh, 1 is wool, less than 1% is all other fabric types. Manufactured fibers make up 5% and synthetic fibers 65%. So things have changed very, very drastically. And now let's talk about that breakdown between what a natural fiber looks like and what a synthetic fiber looks like. Natural fibers, uh, there's two different types of them. There's cellulosic fibers and protein fibers. Cellulosic fibers come from, from plants like cotton, right? Cotton is a plant. And then we have protein fibers like wool that come from animals. And some other types of cellulosic fibers are cotton, flax, jute, and hemp whereas some types of protein fibers are wool, cashmere, silk, and mohair. The most common natural fiber used commercially to this day is cotton. One third of all fabrics are made from cotton fibers. More specifically, let's look at some of these um, fibers. First, we'll talk about cotton, and you'll see that I've added a little flag here to the top left corner, and that's gonna show us as I move from slide to slide, where these environmental impacts come from, what stage of the uh, production process. So cotton is a water intensive crop. And although most people think that because it is a natural plant, right? It's a natural fiber comes from a plant. It's not gonna have as many environmental impacts, but that's actually not true. As you can see here, cotton is a water intensive crop requiring a total of 20 inches of rainfall in order to grow. To put that into perspective, it takes 700 gallons of water to produce just one t-shirt. And that's assuming that the cotton is being grown in a region that receives a lot of rainfall. When cotton is being grown in regions where that's not the case, irrigation is required. Irrigation is, uh, while helpful, is extremely inefficient. 50% of the water being used for irrigation actually ends up being wasted. And that's not the only problem we get with irrigation. Irrigation also creates an imbalance in the land's water table or the content, the water content of the soil. Cotton is also a fairly delicate crop. It requires very many pesticides and fertilizers in order to help it grow so that it's nice and stable. And uh, these are harmful to other plants, animals, and people. And their environmental impact increases when we have this excess amount of water that creates a runoff, a harmful runoff, for other plants and animals that aren't you know, directly near our cotton. The soil also suffers from the effects of growing and harvesting cotton through wide crop rotation. What wide crop rotation means is that we have these land parcels that we use to grow cotton for textiles. And we grow cotton there once, harvest it, 
right when that's done, we grow cotton again, harvest it, and we continue to do that over and over and over until we've depleted all of the nutrients from the soil. And once we can no longer grow cotton there, we take that and we do the same thing in a new parcel of land. So we keep depleting the soil without giving it the nutrients that it needs. Now let's talk about the production process. During the production process, uh, dyes, bleaching agents, and finishing chemicals are required, right, for an aesthetic. Cotton's natural color can vary between different shades of off-white, and, uh, and in order to get that stark white crisp, crisp t-shirt look we all love, uh, our cotton has to be bleached. And in order to dispose of these bleaching agents, they tend to be released into nearby water sources, contaminating them. And the same goes for dyes. I'm currently wearing a light pink t-shirt, so this also had to be dyed. Our cotton didn't grow this like nice shade of salmon pink naturally. And um, extensive water and heat usage are required in order to dye and bleach cotton. So we also have to factor that in. And with consumption, uh, cotton is susceptible to shrinkage in warm temperatures. So uh, it doesn't actually have too many environmental impacts where that's concerned. We typically tend to wash our cotton uh, garments in cooler temperatures. And in case the connection uh, is a little difficult to make, water is not naturally warm. So whenever our garments have to be washed in warmer temperatures, that requires more energy and we have to factor that into an environmental impact as well. Moving on to flax. This is a term I had never heard previously to my class. I was like, I haven't, that's not a type of fabric because we call cotton uh, the fabric, the same thing we call cotton the plant. But we use flax to make linen. And most of the environmental impacts that come from flax come from the growth and harvesting process. So we're really only gonna focus, focus on that natural resources portion of the linear economy. And of course, there are environmental impacts that come from this during the consumption and production process, but they're really, they're just standard, so we're not gonna cover them. And um, flax is used to make linen, which is considered to be a pretty good summer fabric with a lot of breathability, great for these hot summer months. It is more sustainable than cotton due to the fact that flax just tends to be a more resilient plant that requires less chemicals and pesticides. Uh, it does require water, but in a different way than cotton does. It's not as much of a water intensive crop, but water is required for the removal of the fiber from the stem. And um, soil is also undergoing some of those adverse effects with flax. The longer a fiber is, the softer it is to the touch. So the longer a fiber is, the more desirable. And in order to obtain those longer fibers, flax is usually pulled during the harvesting phase and this process contributes to soil erosion. Next, we have wool. I know logic says that because wool doesn't come from a plant, it doesn't require water to grow or cause, cause soil erosion, but that's not true. Wool comes from animals that need to drink water and who graze pastures very closely, right? So that too causes soil erosion. Of course, these effects aren't as significant as they are when we're actually growing a plant like cotton or another cellulosic fiber. Um, but when we deal with animals, much like when we deal with humans, we have to fa factor in their treatment into an environmental impact, right? And many sheep uh, undergo unsafe shearing practices and horrible living conditions, but we do have with wool some alternatives. We have organic wool and recycled wool. Organic wool comes from sheep that are fed organically grown feed. They graze on land that's not treated with pesticides and they're not dipped in synthetic pesticides. Recycled wool comes from scraps of new woven and felted fabrics that are shredded back into fiber and then reused. This process though weakens the fibers so they don't perform as well as what we would call, you know, your standard wool or a virgin wool. During the production process, um, wool actually happens to be the only fiber that requires hot water cleaning before it's processed into a yarn. And again, the hotter the water, the more it's environmental impacts because we have to use more energy. And um, with consumption, wool is, it's a nicer fabric, right? More luxurious and more desirable, but at the same time requires a lot more care. 
So um, typically wool garments are suggested that they be dry cleaned and where dry cleaning is concerned, um, there, with that comes the use of chemicals that are known to be uh, carcinogens. Moving on from natural fibers to manufactured fibers. Manufactured fibers are any fiber that's been derived from a chemical compound where the original form is not recognized as a fiber. And we have uh, two types of manufactured fibers, regenerated and synthetic. Regenerated fibers come from plant matter, but that aren't already in a fiber form. So if we were to take a piece of wood, it would undergo a chemical process, and then from there we'd be able to turn it into a fiber. But we're not gonna really be focusing on regenerated fibers today. We're mostly gonna focus on synthetic since those make up 65% of the uh, fabric production, right? So uh, synthetic fibers are made from raw materials, often petroleum-based chemicals or petrochemicals. And some of the types of synthetic fibers include nylon, spandex, polyester, and acrylic. 17 to 20% of the world's industrial water pollution comes from the use of hazardous chemicals in textile manufacturing. Um, nylon was the first synthetic fiber and the first fiber to be developed in the US. Nylon is a resistant fiber that doesn't degrade very quickly. It is made from petrochemicals and produces nitrous oxide releases nitrous oxide or greenhouse gas into the atmosphere during the production process. Something that's important to note about nylon is that while I just mentioned it's a resistant fiber and it doesn't degrade quickly in our closets, that's also going to mean that it's not going to degrade quickly in the landfill, right? And the process takes over 200 years, so that's definitely something to consider when making a purchase. With nylon during the production process, we actually require, it actually requires less water and energy than processing cellulosic fibers. But once the nylon fiber is produced, it doesn't really require very many other anything's really. It's not a fabric that requires a lot of special care uh, or washing with, you know, warm water, dry cleaning, any of that. So once it passes a production process, Nylon and most other synthetic fibers are pretty eco-friendly, which is something I don't think a lot of people think about. You, you hear the word natural and you automatically think that's better, right? But this uh, threw me for a loop when I was learning all of this. Next, we're gonna talk about polyester. Polyester was the first fiber produced, it was the first polyester fiber was produced in England and it was introduced to the US in 1950. The most widely, it's the most widely used synthetic fiber due to its ability to be mixed with other fibers. So all fibers have different traits and characteristics that make them desirable for different reasons. And with polyester, the beauty of polyester is that it can very easily be mixed with other fiber types so that we can um, increase its appeal in certain characteristics that it lacks on its own. And that's something most other fibers either can't do at all or don't do as well. Um, having said that, polyester can be made to have proper properties very similar to those of natural fibers. So there are um, ways to make polyester seem very similar to cotton and to have very similar characteristics. And the production requires less energy than the production of nylon. And that's what we're gonna be looking at right now. Chemicals required for production contain compounds like heavy metals that have long lasting impacts and that's essentially the biggest downside with polyester. Once a polyester garment is purchased, its environmental impacts are pretty similar to those of nylon. And um, one of the most important environmental differences between polyester and nylon is actually that polyester can be recycled. Yay! And um, while it is possible to obtain recycled polyester from pre-existing polyester fibers or clothing garments that have already made from polyester, most recycled polyester is actually derived from the recycling of water bottles. If your uh, recycled polyester is coming from that fiber to fiber process, which would be, you know, like a polyester top becoming a different polyester top, that would be considered a closed loop 
process. And that would mean that nothing would go to the landfill and that's actually the most environmentally friendly way to produce recycled polyester. But um, it's actually, it weakens the, the fiber a little bit more. So it's that's why it's typically done from, from a water bottle uh, recycling. But production of recycled polyester has the ability to decrease air pollution by up to 85%. So that's a lot, right? <laughs> um, very important to continue to keep up with these new developments that we have in recycled fa fiber fabrics and fibers. So Emmy, now that I've gone over the most commonly used fibers, uh, are, do you have any questions? Yes, there is one question, and it's a really, okay. really interesting one. It's from Lizette. Um, she asks, are there any political actions currently in progress relating to the fashion industry? Um, I'm actually not sure, but we do have um, Manny, who is really great. He's a, another Tree People employee, and he, um, he focuses on policy and um, all of that good stuff. So I can, uh, Lizette, if you want to drop your email in the chat. I can follow up with him or have him reach out with a, a, a better answer than I can provide at the moment. Or uh, my email will be at the end of the presentation. You can jot that down and email me yourself uh, just so that we can connect on that and I can answer your question for you. And I believe this is being recorded and it will be shared with you all. So uh, Lizette, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, I have no idea either regarding in the US, but I know that in Europe, there has been some initiatives, like in France, they're trying to ban um, the disposal of not unconsumed clothing, which ends up in landfills often. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to ban that by 2023. And then I also think England tried to implement something similar to address the huge carbon footprint of the fashion industry. And actually the government rejected those proposals. And so there was a lot of outcry, but I, I don't know anything about, you know, actions being taken in the, U in the U.S., but I would imagine that there isn't that many. But yeah, I, I would have to agree with you. I don't, I don't believe just off of the top of my head from what I've read recently that there is anything going on like that in the U.S., but um, the UK uh, has actually been leading the game as far as sustainable fashion goes for a really long time with uh, Stella McCartney being one of the first fashion designers to really uh, take this into consideration and try to make all of her designs as eco-friendly as possible. And that brings us to <laughs> shopping smarter and not harder. So um, now that we know what the waste issue is, and what is residing in our landfills, it's important that we know how we can change that or have some solutions, right? So the first thing that I would suggest is understanding how to read clothing labels. And this is something that I had to learn myself and I think has made a huge impact in the way that I shop. So understanding our clothing labels is gonna help us find more sustainable materials. The three that I would personally recommend are linen, wool, and recycled polyester. Understanding a clothing label is also gonna help us understand how to care for our garments and how to extend their lifespan, which is really, really important. And that's the main goal, I would say, as far as this goes. Extending the lifespan of your garments is the best thing you can do. 99% of consumed goods are used and then disposed of within six months, right? So that goes to show how short the lifespan of a typical garment or the average garment is. The average article of clothing is actually only worn six to seven times before it's discarded. And as I previously mentioned, this is typically due to the quick release of new designs by the fast fashion industry and the short lifespan of badly made garments, right? According to an article published by the BBC titled, Can Fashion Ever Be Sustainable? Continuing to actively wear garment for just nine months longer could diminish its environmental impacts by 20 to 30%. So as I said, that's our main goal. We wanna make sure that whatever we purchase is going to live longer in our closets or in someone else's closet. And that brings me to something, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I get excited sometimes, but yes, 
extending the lifespan of our garments is the best thing we can do and part of that comes with care i know i used to be guilty of this in the past where i'd buy a t-shirt it wasn't really the best made t-shirt two you know weeks into it it wasn't looking as nice or crisp as it did the first time i wore it so then i would be like oh well i need a new one <laughs> you know and that's not great but there are steps that we can take to extend that lifespan and that is to know how to care for them and that's also something that we find in the clothing label and i know those are tricky to read there's a lot of symbols on there not as many words as there should be or if they are they're very confusing very small right so i want to share with you all this video i found online and it's going to explain what the um laundry care symbols are on our clothing tags to help us decipher how to read that and make clothing tags not as intimidating. Let me know if uh, you can hear this, Emmy, or if I need to do anything to, to fix that. Hmm. No. Let me see. Sometimes you just have to click on it a few times. I'm trying. Give me a second. I'm going to move this. I'm having some difficulty with the video. Oh, there we go. And with that, I do want to mention that it's not just about knowing how to care for what we have in our closet, but when we do go shopping, let, let's look at that tag before we actually make the purchase, right? If you can stay away from buying garments that require dry cleaning, which as we mentioned, um, does require a lot of chemical use, then maybe that's not the option for you, right? If you see that it requires warm water, to um, do our laundry, then maybe that's not the best option. And knowing how to read those tags is going to help us make better, smarter choices. But that's not the only thing we can do. There are other ways to reduce the carbon footprint of your clothing, and the first one I have on this list is thrifting, right? Um, that's definitely gonna extend the lifespan of a garment. It might not be, it, it'll be new to you too. So that's, I think, a plus, right? Um, you can also upcycle. I know for me personally, whenever I go thrifting, I always have a really hard time finding clothing that I like or that fits me the way I want it to. So I actually took up sewing so that I could learn to upcycle everything that I purchase. So if I see something in a really cool fabric that I really like and I cannot pass up or something that I love but doesn't fit me just the right way, then I take matters into my own hands and I make it look good. <laughs> so uh, that's a really important skill to have that I would recommend um, taking up. You can also shop sustainable slow fashion brands. And if you would all like some tips on what sustainable or slow fashion brands there are out there, or there's even websites that help you find 
sustainable uh, fashion brands that I might not even be familiar with. If you'd like to get in contact with me about that, I can definitely send some suggestions your way so uh, we can make your shopping experience, um, well, more enjoyable and more sustainable. And you can also repurpose and repair your garments. Let's take it back to the way we used to do it, right? Before World War I. <laughs> So uh, these are some of the ideas that I have, but there's definitely a lot more out there that you can do and being educated is already the first step, right? So feel free to ask me any questions if you have them or reach out to me by email for suggestions, tips on how you can be a more sustainable shopper and I'd be more than happy to get back to you. Thank you so much, Maria. That was extremely informative. I literally didn't know anything about how to read clothing labels. Um, I don't know why they don't, yeah, I don't know how come, you know, it's such a not well-known thing. Maybe they do, do it on purpose so that, you know, it feeds the fast fashion cycle. I'm not sure, but. Yeah, and there's actually laws that require that those tags be there for that same purpose to try and help with um, the sustainability issue. Well, um, does anybody have any questions for Maria regarding fast fashion? Otherwise, thank you so much for being here today, tuning in, learning more about sustainability in the fashion industry. And feel free to reach out to her, ask her any questions, follow us on Instagram, follow us on social media, email learn at home with three people if you have any questions regarding the program. And next week, we don't have a topic. We're taking a little break, but the week after that is native plant maintenance. So stay tuned and we have a lot more exciting things coming. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I will put my email in the chat very quickly. I did see a question regarding that. So, um, but it's madame at treepeople.org. Fairly easy to remember. I was blessed that way. <laughs>